Sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister for the Economy. I call David Honeyford. Uh, the Department is developing a renewable electricity support scheme to incentivise investment, ensure fair price for electricity produced locally, and encourage diversification to support the security of supply. Following a recent consultation, officials have been working with consultants to define the optimal scheme structure. High level design for the scheme will be published this month as part of the Department's re response to the consultation. The next phase will involve modelling and a financial impact assessment alongside the establishment of a legislative pathway, state aid approval and institutional roles and responsibilities necessary for delivery. Stakeholder engagement will be essential as we move forward to deliver a final scheme design, maximising the community benefit opportunities and ensuring prosperity for all. Mr. Hollyford. Uh, thank you and welcome the response from the Minister. But given the makeup of our economy and mainly small and micro businesses, can the Minister ensure or confirm with us that the scheme will also include support for low or smaller scale projects from half a megawatt and not just from the five megawatt that's been previously said? Minister. Yes, well options for micro generation support, including domestic renewable generation such as solar panels, will continue to be evaluated as part of our net zero ambitions. The Windsor Framework enables the extension of the VAT relief for energy saved materials previously available in Britain only to the north. This means that people here will also be able to apply zero rates of VAT to the installation of energy saved materials such as heat pumps and solar panels. Homeowners may wish to seek independent advice on solar panels, heat pumps and other energy efficiency matters from organisations such as the NI Energy Advice Service. And these technologies have the potential to provide an attractive payback to homeowners without grant support. I call Mr. McGuigan. Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, maybe to outline how his department's proposed scheme uh, differs from other renewable electricity schemes across these islands? Well, sir. The, uh, the proposed scheme will have similarities to the REST scheme, RESS, in the south, and the current contract for different scheme in Britain. Similar auction-based schemes have also been successful across other European countries and are a well-established option for incentivising renewables. Previous research commissioned by the Department identified this type of scheme as the optimal form of support for the North and in the recent consultation confirmed it as the preferred option of the power sector stakeholders. From this, a bespoke design local scheme is being developed. Any scheme we introduce will take account of the lessons learned from other schemes on these islands and address the specific needs of our own local market. Matthew Till. You, uh, Mr. Speaker, Minister, uh, previous iteration of the protocol, now the Windsor Framework, omitted uh, guarantees of origin th uh, from the north being sold into the south and wider onto the single European, the, the, the electricity market in Europe. Will, Europe. will you explore with your uh, officials getting that added into the protocol so that we can benefit from our access to the single European market? Minister. Well, I think there are some issues which have been addressed in my previous answer, which have been addressed by the, the Windsor Framework in relation to that. If there are outstanding issues as we move through the design uh, of this scheme, then we're more than happy to take those up with the relevant authorities in London and Brussels. Jim Allister. I ask about another renewable scheme, namely the non-domestic RHI scheme. When can one expect the publication of the consultation report? And is there any hope of a realistic tariff for the users comparable to what exists elsewhere, or are we going to continue the folly of sending back money which is being unspent in this scheme? Minister. Well, it is my intention. I, I do believe the RHI scheme should have been concluded some time back in the previous mandate, uh, but it is my intention to bring that matter to a speedy conclusion as I can in as far away possible as I can, and that will in turn allow us to access other funding that is available and has not as yet been taken up uh, to, to look at other renewable schemes. <coughs> Nilla McAllister. Minister. <coughs> Business improvement districts are the responsibility for the Department of Communities. As Economy Minister, my assessment is that they are an excellent example of collaboration and cooperation at a local level. Bids enable local businesses to seek decisions about the issues that matter to them and about which they know best. They can be drivers for regeneration of our town and city centres, making our towns and cities more attractive for visitors and creating a positive trading environment that helps local business to thrive. Ms. McAllister. 
Uh, thank you and thank the Minister for the, his answer thus far. And whilst I recognise that business improvement districts fall under the Department of Communities, um, would you agree that working hand in hand with the Department to, in order for our local areas to thrive, that is very important, and thus would you agree that working further with the Department of Communities regarding the establishment of additional business improvement districts to add to our local economies? Minister. Well, I'm very happy uh, to work across departmentally in, in relation to anything which I think can improve our, our economy. I previously had a strong working relationship with my colleague here, Deidre Hargy, when she was Minister for Communities and I was in finance, and I would equally hope to have a strong working relationship with Gordon Lyons now that he's taken up that post. Uh, I mean, they, one of the, the processes that I outlined in my own vision for the economy was about regional balance, and I believe where we have local actors in deciding what the local priorities are uh, with the support of government, then you may get a much better outcome, a much better policy outcome in, in terms of what the local needs are. So if there is a case for uh, more investment in business improvement districts, then I'm very happy uh, to talk through the Minister for Communities uh, around that. But I, I believe the more people we have active uh, and working in the local area deciding the economic uh, future and best policy for that specific area, then the better the outcome will be. Can the Minister provide an update on the High Street Task Force, please? Minister. The Task Force report delivering a 21st century High Street will be of interest to a number of departments. I have asked my own officials to take forward the recommendations relevant to my department. I understand that Executive Officer Ministers will shortly write to Executive colleagues, inviting them to consider how they can take forward the findings of the report. Justin McDonald. Will the Minister join with me in commending the work of Newry Bed Eamon Connolly during the recent floods, who has literally got his sleeves rolled up and was carting sandbags and doing immense work to protect local businesses and stand up for local businesses during that time of huge duress for them? Minister. Yes, certainly will. And uh, he was very much at the forefront of that, as was the, uh, business, the bid organisation in Newry. There were many others. Uh, we're out also helping at that time uh, local elected representatives, volunteers and uh, very many other people and it, I think, displayed the true spirit that there is in our areas and many other areas when the, these type of crises uh, come along then that people do pull together to try and provide support to each other. I hope that in the, the scheme that I have funded have been run through the Council uh, that the uh, level of support required for businesses will be delivered quickly as possible. To admit it. Three, please. Minister. My assessment is that students already take on a significant level of debt in order to access higher education, and that adding to this debt is not the right approach. I am committed to working with the higher education sector to embed sustainable funding arrangements that enable the sector to thrive and create more opportunities for our students. Mr. Bede. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. That wasn't a challenge, and it certainly isn't a, a, a party's position of, of intent. Um, but having spoken to the Vice Chancellor of both Ulster University and Queen's University, who are really concerned about the number of student places here in Northern Ireland, we hemorrhage an awful lot of students overseas. Uh, does the Minister have a plan to be able to increase those um, student numbers? Minister. Yes, and I have also spoken to both Vice Chancellors on a number of occasions prior to taking up office and, and since I've taken up office. And I do agree uh, that this is a uh, uh, the, the funding of students and access of students to university, the numbers of students we have going to uh, higher uh, ed level education is something that we collectively need to work on. So, but we are operating in a very limited uh, and constrained financial, public finances uh, situation. I hope that that improves uh, as our negotiations with the Treasury develop. Uh, but I want to look at as imaginative ways as possible as we can to ensure the universities can have the resources they need, can take more students in uh, to avail of the facilities that they develop. And we can do so in a way which doesn't place an additional burden on students themselves uh, in order to access that. Thank you, Ken Coley, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Will the Minister consider increasing maintenance support for students? Minister. Yes, I will. We are looking at uh, ways to try and, and provide support uh, to students. I have asked officials to identify options for that. However, as I said in, in the previous response, the ability to increase support is limited by the very difficult circumstances that we find ourselves in as a result of 10, 12 years of austerity. Uh, but I would hope that the executive can have a positive outcome in terms of its negotiations with the British government in this matter, and that we do get uh, more support to enable us to support students. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Uh, in 
my constituency in South Belfast, we have a lot of newcomer families and we know that um, education is a gateway to um, prosperity for the family. I'm just wondering what support you can give to university to encourage more entrants from that section of the community. Thank you. Minister. Well, about, I think both universities have a very good programmes and, and, and some of them run very directly on the ground in, in South Belfast as well to try and encourage more inclusion. Uh, and I would expect that those programmes will include people who have arrived uh, in this country to, to try and access f uh, further and higher education as well. So there are inclusion programmes. Uh, that both universities are very proactive in that. If, there, if the member or others sense that there is a gap in terms of people who have come into the country needing support, and sometimes there, there is support needed in terms of translation uh, and other services that are provided perhaps by different departments, but if there is a sense that there is a gap there, I am very ha uh, glad to hear, uh, happy to hear. Uh, of, of, of any issues that arise in that regard. I am very happy to speak to universities about their programmes, but I do know that they are very proactive in this area. Colin Killen. Uh, question number four. Minister. <coughs> Assured Skills Academies are very effective in providing a successful pathway for individuals seeking new, a new career. Since 2011, 183 academies have been delivered upskilling more than 2,900 individuals. All those trained were guaranteed a job interview with over 2,500 gaining employment, a success rate of 86 per cent. This has been a success for the local economy, with starting salaries totaling 55 million generated between 2011 and 2023. Academies address the skills needs of investment companies and existing local companies by ensuring a pipeline of potential skilled, job-ready employees. The academy model is agile and is responsive to local economic and workforce needs and will continue to adapt. Ms. Killian. Um, so you have partly answered the question I have in terms of local and large um, companies, but will you ensure that the Assured Skills Academies will continue to have your support um, in terms of you know, local opportunities in conjunction with the potential opportunities that big companies and indeed FDI may bring? Yes, sir. Yes, the, uh, the, the member is correct. In the past, the shared skills model was primarily used for larger companies and FDI. Working with a single company meant it was easier to identify the number of vacancies and secure a guaranteed interview. But I have asked my officials to gear more academies towards SMEs throughout the North by getting multiple small companies to come together and collectively identify their needs. This has already started to happen, for example, in response to increased demand for skilled welders, more than 180 people, many with no previous experience have completed welding training with 150 hired by participating companies. In the current financial year, three collaborative Assured Skills Welding Academies have been launched for delivery by the South West College, providing employment opportunities in Dungannon, Cookstown and Maherfeld. And work is ongoing with the six further education colleges to identify suitable collaborative proposals to meet the skills need of smaller companies in all sectors. Declan Kearney. Minister. Growing social enterprise is a vital part of my economic vision. Social Enterprise NI, which delivers the Social Enterprise Work Programme, has a key role to play. As an initial measure, I have increased the budget for the programme. My department will now work with Social Enterprise NI to develop an ambitious action plan to further grow the sector and to take forward the recommendations from the Community Wealth Building Report commissioned by the former Communities Minister, Deirdre Hargy. Mr. Kearney. Thank you, and thank you, Minister. Uh, policy and strategy around social enterprise. Will you give uh, greater consideration to stronger support for workers' buyouts? Minister. Yes, I have commissioned a piece of research on this. Uh, I, I am aware of this facility actually in my own constituency where this has happened very successfully. And it's a, a process that is not often followed. Uh, that doesn't seem to be promoted very much, uh, but yet the benefits in terms of securing employment uh, and, and workers having uh, control of their own employment is, is undoubtedly uh, evident there in, in areas which have been successful. So I have been uh, alerted to the fact that there is, is not a, a significant uptake in that because there is a lack of information. Uh, and certainly in terms of the work that I'm doing here, uh, we have commissioned research and we will continue to make sure that that is available to more people to understand that that option may be available to them. Question six, Patsy Minister. Question seven, please. Broadarm. 
apologies. There was a question withdrawn, so I'm, I'm skipping over. Uh, the, uh, the cost of loan crisis continues to have a significant impact on many sections of our society, including students at further education colleges. Student support officers based in every college help students access further education grants. The Hardship Fund, Care to Learn, Child Care and Educational Maintenance Allowance, Home to College, Transport and Free School Meals are also available. This total supports about £10 million per year. In, the, in recognition of the current difficulties, additional support totaling £1.7 million has been provided to college. I have also asked for a review of student support within further education to ensure support measures are being targeted as well as possible on the basis of need. Mr. Thank you, and thank you for your answer. The announcement that the Minister of Financial Support for Students at Universities did not contain particularly any further financial support for FE students. Was there any particular reason why they were left out of that announcement? Minister. Well, as I say, we did announce 1.7 million additional uh, in recent times uh, for further education uh, students. Uh, there is a recognition that costs attached to higher education are more significant uh, for many students, uh, but I want to ensure that there is a level of support available across all. If we had more money, uh, we would certainly put more money into hardship funds uh, to ensure people do that. Getting people opportunities to get back into work to get uh, education and skills is vital. The further education colleges are going to play a key role in relation to all of that. What we need to ensure is that we create pathways for people who are trying to access, uh, on their own terms, many with other responsibilities in their lives, to access skills, education, and an ability uh, to, to uh, get back into the workforce. Because it's part of our, my own vision is, is about good jobs, better jobs for people, about regional balance, and these things will all contribute to that. So we will be intent on looking to do as much as we can in that area in the time ahead. Henry Hargy. Thanks for the response. How many students um, benefit from existing financial support measures? Sure. Well, the department funds, as I say, around uh, 10 million per annum to provide a range of ongoing financial supports for uh, further education students, uh, including further education grants, the hardship fund, care to learn, home to college, free school meals, clothing allowance, educational maintenance allowance is also available for eligible students. A further 4.5 million per annum is provided to the further education colleges to provide student, uh, support to students with disability. Uh, within the 22-23 academic year, further education student support measures supported close to 13,000 students. David Briggs. Mr. Speaker, question eight, Minister. The Department is aware of the ongoing discussions between Boeing and Spirit Aerosystems about a potential acquisition. The Department is not aware of any immediate impact on its Northern Ireland operations, and it would be wrong to speculate on potential outcomes for Spirit locally as these discussions continue. My office is already engaging with Spirit to confirm a date for a meeting to discuss the current situation. Mr. Briggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, I would just encourage the Minister and ask him to um, keep an eye on the, the situation and to, to continue to engage with Spirit. Um, we know that um, speculation, as it may be, may lead to nervousness amongst um, what, uh, this, the, this, the workers at what is a very key employer uh, in East Belfast and in Northern Ireland generally. Uh, so I just ask him to continue that engagement, as I know my uh, party colleagues, Philip Breton, Gavin Robinson MP, have been engaging with them. Thank you. Minister. Yes, I understand from the members' constituency perspective, but generally across Belfast there would be concern uh, when, when there is an acquisition of what the future is for people who work there. So people are uh, entitled to be uh, concerned about their own future in relation to that. And obviously our intent is to try and ensure the support uh, for uh, as many workers as we can. But as I say, it is early days in those discussions. I did take the opportunity, it was in, it was in the States, uh, to, to mention to people about the uh, potential uh, takeover by Boeing and then if there were issues that would arise from that that we have access to discussions with senior people in America uh, in order to protect jobs as best we possibly can going forward. Peter McReynolds. I thank the Minister for his response. Will the Minister confirm if he will commit to working closely with the Department for Business and Trade on this matter? Mr. Well, we will work with whoever uh, we have. It's, as I say, this at the moment is a commercial discussion between two companies. What, what we would be concerned about are the implications for that in terms of the economy here, in terms of jobs. 
uh, in terms of the presence uh, of, of that manufacturing within uh, Belfast. Uh, and so it, it's probably early days to decide who we need to speak to just yet, uh, but when we do get a sense of what's shaping up and we have asked for a meeting, then if we have to go to London or if we need to go to America to talk to people about that there, uh, then that, that's what we'll do in order to try and protect jobs and the economy. Minister. Tax is one of several factors that companies consider when making investment decisions. However, the way in which Treasury proposed to deduct funding from the executive block grant at a time of public spending cuts meant that reducing corporation tax was not affordable. That will remain the case unless the British Government changes its approach to funding public services and to adjusting the block grant for uh, devolved taxes. In the meantime, it is my intention to create an attractive investment proposition for firms by improving skills and ensuring that companies can take full advantage of the dual market access opportunities that exist through the Windsor Framework. Uh, Mr. Brett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his response? But could I ask the Minister if he could put on record, is it his position that there should be all island harmonisation of corporation tax here? Minister. Yes, I think that should be our ambition because uh, I think that is beneficial uh, in terms of the proposition that we sell internationally. Uh, but the, the case is that the way it has been presented to us from the Treasury as back as far as 10 years ago, and I was involved in those discussions at that time, uh, makes it uh, unaffordable for us. Uh, and it was then, and it, it probably even more so now. Now, if that situation changes, uh, I think that we can pursue this with some uh, renewed uh, opportunity. But uh, as it sits currently, uh, in terms of that approach, I do not think it is affordable for us. I, I think that view is broadly shared across the executive. And I remember the previous Minister for the Economy from your own party uh, say, uh, outlining the same view when she was asked about the potential of uh, corporation tax being devolved and reduced. Following with uh, companies in the US last week, does the Minister believe that the North is an attractive place to invest? Minister. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the visit was a very successful one in terms of our engagement. Uh, I spent some time in New York engaging with businesses there. I have to say that uh, corporation tax was not significantly raised. I, I struggled to remember it being raised at all. The key issue for people uh, was the, the people that we have working here, the skills, the, the dual access to both the uh, British and European markets. Though, uh, the, the fact that we had an executive back in place, which meant uh, people had a confidence that they could come and engage with us uh, at the right level in order to, uh, to uh, make inquiries and, and make approaches in terms of their own business interests. So those are the key factors uh, which are in But there is a very significant level of interest. The dual market access has, has piqued a certain interest, not just in, the, in America, but also in, in Europe as well. Uh, and, and I think it's our duty in the same way to try and exploit that to the fullest possible way we can. Tom Elliott. Thank you, Mr. I appreciate the answers from the Minister. Just in, in a follow-up to, to Mr Brett's uh, question on harmonisation with the Republic of Ireland, if the circumstances were correct, would you actually support uh, a lower corporation tax for Northern Ireland than ROI that would give businesses a huge advantage here compared to those in ROI and GB? Minister. Well, I, I, I don't actually believe that we need to be in competition. I think that's been the mindset here for too long, that we're competing. We have much more to benefit from collaboration. Uh, and I think it's an easier proposition if you have a single tax rate across the island uh, in terms of our international investment. So I, I, I wouldn't be uh, arguing for a race to the bottom on this. Uh, corporation tax uh, reduction is something which interests companies and, and can attract more investment. But it's not the single silver bullet. Uh, when I was in, in, in America last week, uh, as I say, people were talking to me about the skills or people with dual access to the markets, about an executive being in place. Those are the key factors that they were interested in. So I, I don't believe uh, that we should be in a competition basis. I think if Invest are working collaboratively with the IDA and Enterprise Ireland, we get a much better outcome than trying to compete with each other. Dion Forsyth. Your question to end, please. Minister. Ensuring that parent, working parents have access to high-quality, affordable childcare is a priority for the Executive. We need a childcare solution which aligns with my own economic goals of good jobs, increased productivity and regional balance. And to this end, I am committed to working with the Minister for Education as he develops and implements the early years and childcare strategy. Thank you, and thank you, Minister, for that, and I welcome the Minister's commitment to the childcare strategy. Um, but I would ask further if he is willing to um, engage with the sector or provide any business intervention support as the 
number of nurseries closing down is rising. Employers for Child Care have reported today about half of the child care providers in Northern Ireland are reported as struggling or distressed in terms of um, a, a potential business rate relief or some sort of support. I was wondering would the Minister consider meeting with them and discussing? Minister. Well, I thank the member for her, her question. I think I understand fully what she's saying. I've engaged over the last uh, couple of years uh, very strongly with the childcare sector, so I know the pressures that they're facing. Even in the solutions she has outlined, some of them go into the Department of Finance, some of them uh, may be responsible to the Department of Economy. The lead is the Department of Education, and I think that underlines the, this, the sensible proposal that has been agreed with the executive. We all have an input into this, and we try and do it as quickly as we possibly can, because uh, one department heading off with its solution and another department heading off with a different solution uh, is not what the childcare sector needs. We need them involved in the design of a strategy that will support not just uh, childcare providers and those who work in the childcare sector, but also support parents who are trying to access it. And in terms of my own particular interest, the more people we have available uh, to come back to work and allow to get back into the workforce, then the better for the economy overall. So I do think it is a multi-departmental approach, and we all have a, a part to bring to the solution, and I'm very willing to do that in terms of the Department of the Economy. Cathy Mason. Um, in addition to assisting the education minister, are there any steps that the minister can take within his own department to improve childcare provision? Minister, well, I think part of the solution is uh, actually what firms, particularly firms which are well established and, and, uh, and in good economic shape, uh, what they can bring uh, to that. Uh, I also think, and we've had this discussion uh, with business. I also think that employers themselves need to consider how they allow, particularly women, to re-access work. Because uh, if it's an all-or-nothing, uh, only a full-time job offer, and people have to make a, a, sometimes, which is a very difficult decision in terms of leaving uh, childcare responsibilities to go back full-time to work. So we have had this conversation with employers, and I think we need to continue that dialogue. That they have a responsibility, both in terms of childcare provision for staff, who they are very keen to get and to hold on to, but also in terms of allowing, particularly women, back into the workforce. Uh, that there need to be more options than simply a full-time occupation on offer to them. Ah, Hunter. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, we know the childcare sector uh, is in absolute crisis and it needs support now. Uh, and we had warm words last month uh, about this. Um, but what steps or immediate actions has your department taken since last month um, to support this sector? Mr. Some which I've just outlined is, is dialogue with people in the private sector uh, to ensure that they play a part in this. The, the, the private sector uh, are tell us all the time that they can't get the people that they need. They need more. People, they need more people with skills, so they have a contribution to make to ensuring that people can access uh, either education skills or directly into work. Uh, and if the childcare is a significant issue and all of that, the affordability of childcare means that many uh, people who have that responsibility can't leave that and go back into work because it's, it's a, a detriment to their own family uh, in terms of the resources available to them. So we have already begun uh, discussion and dialogue with people in that regard, and we will continue <coughs> to work at pace with the other departments around the executive table to make sure that we bring forward a bespoke childcare uh, strategy to suit the particular needs of here. Hi, Harvey. You must first pick our question 11. Minister. Raising productivity is one of my four economic objectives. This will require action on a range, wide range of policies such as trade investment and including making the most of the dual market access, skills, leadership and management of business, investment and innovation, entrepreneurship and a policy for high potential sectors and businesses. I will bring forward actions across all of these areas. I will liaise with the expert critical friends I have asked to advise on my economic vision on these actions to ensure that these will have the impact that is needed. Mr. Harvey. And thank you, Minister, for your response. Minister, further to um, last week's US visit, could you maybe give us an update on the Department's efforts to attract more US investment? Minister. Well, it, it's, it's, it, it, there's an element which is about attracting uh, inward investment here, but there's also an element that we're involved in out there of allowing our own firms to be involved in exports in the States, and quite a lot of them are doing that, and a growing number. Uh, and in that regard, the economic adviser, Joe Kennedy, has been very helpful in making sure the firms that go over get access to the people that they want to talk to. So it's a two-way street. It's not going over with a begging bowl to ask for inward investment. But, of course, a, a strong part of the, the trip when I was out there last week was about uh, talking to people out there. It was also about uh, having people who are already doing business here, because the biggest selling point 
uh, for people doing inward investment is the fact that 70 per cent of the companies who come here stay and further invest here. Uh, and what we allowed uh, and one of the events last week, I think which was probably the most powerful one, was for people who had actually done that to give their testimony rather than us selling and, and they did a terrific job with that, uh, talking about their experience of working here, the people here, the ethos here uh, and how that was beneficial to them and their company. So we will continue to do that, but it, as I say, it's a two way. We want to create opportunities for local companies here to be able to export to the States uh, and abroad and to take uh, full advantage of that dual market access that we have. Thank you. That brings to an end our, our time for uh, questions. Uh, could I commend the Minister and the members in getting to question number 11, a good interactive exchange. We now move to topicals, and I call Sinead McLaughlin. Minister, I know you will be keenly aware of the challenges facing uh, further education lectures and their ask for pay parity with uh, teaching staff. Do you agree with the principle of pay parity for further education lectures and uh, school teaching staff? Minister. Yes, I bet. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet the trade unions uh, in the first week that I was in office, and I told them I shared their ambition to get uh, further education lectures onto that trajectory where they were linked. Uh, to teach and pay. What we're trying to do with the amount of money available to now is trying to get a settlement for this year to try and give people some support uh, and, and, and agree together to set that trajectory for future years in terms of aligning that with, with teachers' uh, pay. So that's my clear objective. Uh, I know that they're currently considering that offer. I hope that they do take it up. Uh, but nonetheless, regardless of what happens in terms of this year, my objective for further years, I've made it very clear to the, the unions that represent the further education lecturers. Ms. McLaughlin. Minister, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm pleased to hear that that's the direction of travel, but you can appreciate that the lecturers are absolutely livid at the minute uh, at the differentiation between um, for, for teaching staff uh, and, and their colleges. They're actually teaching people that are being paid more than them in those higher level apprenticeship programme. Is there anything that you can do now to step in and support um, that, that sector uh, as they struggle with this pay parity? Minister. I fully understand their, uh, their frustration with how things have developed over the years, and I've seen uh, people in my own local college out uh, on the picket lines over very many years. I think it's a very legitimate demand that they have. What we're trying to do is to get, in terms of the envelope that's available to us, is to try and get an award uh, made to them, uh, which will improve circumstances this year, but then work very closely with them to get them on the right trajectory uh, for future years. So that's, that's all is affordable to us this year because we got a, 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 an uplift uh, in terms of public pay, which was defined uh, by the British government, and the finance minister has tried to stretch that as far as she can, but that gives us a set amount with which to play. Uh, so I, I, I fully understand. I think it's a very, uh, uh, a very supportable argument that they have made in terms of where they should be. Uh, and I share that view that I want to get them into that place. Uh, what I would like to do is try to get a settlement this year and then continue to work uh, in that direction. Well, Tom Elliott. I am wondering if the Minister has met yet with the management of BT and EE regarding the, the potential of closure of the Enniskillen site uh, later this year, and if he has directly met them personally. Minister. <coughs> well, I have not I haven't directly met him, but officials have, have met with him. My special adviser has met with him. He is aware that I have written to them. They have also engaged with the trade unions representing people there, and I understand the concern that there is in the Enniskillen and Fermanagh area in relation to potential of job losses. BT are in an international downsizing uh, exercise, and uh, there is a serious concern because it is not simply the the loss of the job, uh, potential loss of jobs in Fermanagh, but it's also the impact that that has on regional balance as well. So we want to see jobs retained in local areas. So uh, we're awaiting the outcome of consultations, I think, which were to close on, uh, as a result of our own intervention, the, the, the date for that was pushed back two weeks to allow further discussions. I think that is due to close on the 28th, and uh, we, uh, we will be happy to engage with them and we'll see what the recommendations that flow from that are. And as I say, we recognise very clearly, and that was in the tone that I wrote to BT to advise them uh, that this uh, was a very, very bad idea, uh, and that this very much cut across the strategy we have of trying to support more jobs in regional areas. Australia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister uh, for that uh, position that he's, that he's taken. I'd just like to ask if he has had any feedback as to regards what might happen after the current consultation is over, because that's one of the big uncertainties for the staff. What will happen after the current consultation? Minister. 
No, I don't as yet. As I said, they did extend following our intervention. The day after I wrote to them, they extended the consultation process by a further two weeks. That's due to end next week, I think, on the 28th. Uh, and we have no insight in, in, in before that as to what, what decisions may be or propositions may be put on the table in relation to that. But we will keep a very close eye on it, and uh, we are determined to try and support uh, the people from Enniskill as, as far as we can. Bear in mind, BT is a private company, uh, but nonetheless, we are determined to support uh, the, the people who work in that facility down there as best we can uh, and provide as much encouragement uh, to BT and to EE to keep the jobs that they have there. Alicia McHugh. Uh, I, uh, just, uh, I note just your comment that uh, it wasn't a begging bowl and that uh, it's a two-way street. Uh, so that, in a respect, that, uh, in relation to your visit to America, could you give us uh, an, an update just on the engagements that, that you had whilst in America? Minister. Well, we had a number of engagements in New York, which primarily were business-focused. Uh, before we went down to Washington for the events down there. Uh, some of that were with businesses from here who were out there, uh, uh, first derivatives we met, uh, but others were with businesses who potentially may be considering investing here. And some of that is commercially sensitive, so we had private discussions, but the objective uh, in that was firstly to promote the idea of people investing here, to, to give greater certainty uh, and information in relation to the executive being back and what that meant, but also in terms of dual market access and what that would mean for them. And those were the key areas uh, of interest for them. I also met tour operators who bring people to Ireland uh, from America uh, as part of the Tourism Ireland event that I attended in New York as well, uh, and had very useful dialogue with them in terms of the issues they faced. And of course, ETA is a concern uh, for them, uh, as well as, as they raised a number of issues. But a very, very positive mood there in terms of the executive being back up, uh, in terms of the dual market access issues being brought to a significant degree of certainty uh, and the potential for people to get involved not only in doing business in the States, but also bringing business from there to here. Thank you. Uh, uh, and, and frank again too, in terms of agile market access, I think that we can all but appreciate how critical it is uh, in order to expand uh, all our business communications that we have, uh, not only in America but in other places as well. So in terms of our trading relationship, uh, how important and vital is that uh, and that it's dealt with in such a way whereby it's uh, creating um, um, uh, an environment that allows business to take place? Minister. Well, what most, I find is what most businesses want is certainty, uh, as much certainty as they can get in terms of their investment decisions. And of course, the United States has been a very critical trading partner and also an uh, inward investment uh, partner for us here. Uh, and so I think, you know, I know there's a debate that has been ongoing this morning in the Assembly in relation to these matters, uh, but I think anything which undoes the degree of certainty that there now is. I think is does it disservice to our ability to grow the economy here and to attract investment and to to uh, grow our own exports into other markets as well? So, you know, part of the part of the attraction uh, that of the of the offering from here was that people had more degree of certainty about what dual access looks like and what it would mean for their businesses. If we have an ongoing uh, dialogue and attempt to 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 uh, to thwart. Uh, the progress that we've made, then I think that only does a disservice and only creates more uncertainty, and that's not the type of atmosphere that businesses want to be engaged in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, does the Minister agree with me that it is inappropriate to continue with the voluntary redundancy scheme of further education staff and potential campus closures before the review of the further education delivery model is completed? Minister. Well, I, I, I'm taking her up on the same question that Janine McLaughlin asked in relation to pay matters. Is that a, a bigger part? I didn't catch the first part of it. Uh, no, Minister, it's, it's to do with the potential um, redundancy scheme in principle and potential campus closures in review of the FE delivery model not being fully completed yet. Uh, in terms of the redundancy process, what we asked, the, uh, it was already started. Uh, expressions of interest had gone out to staff. There had been a significant number of returns, I think many more than, than the places that they were looking uh, to remove by redundancy. We, we ensured that the, uh, one college had uh, also considered the option of compulsory redundancies, that that was taken off the table, and it was only voluntary redundancies that had a regional spread, and it was only for courses that were no longer 
uh, required or that were, were very poor uptake in courses, that it wasn't from key positions within the further education structures. So in a process which is already a very significant way down the tracks, uh, which in my opinion couldn't be halted at that stage, then we tried to make sure that it wasn't doing any further damage to the provision. Uh, and also that what money may be saved from that, uh, it's my intention to reinvest into the further education system. Um, I thank the Minister for his response. I suppose the, the real substantive point is that the review of the FE delivery model has stopped and started over the years. Um, and what does his department intend to do in terms of bringing that to a conclusion? Minister. Yes, uh, there, there's no doubt there have been difficulties there. My, my clear view is, uh, and I think the FE secretary, FE colleges are underutilised. Uh, we need to find ways to get more people into them. That means making courses more accessible, trying to get more resources into them as well, ensuring that staff are properly paid uh, for the work that they do and they have a career progression which is comparable to other people who teach uh, as well. So there is work to be done there and we will engage uh, with the colleges themselves uh, and with the representative body to try and make sure that we're working collaboratively in all of this. There is also work to be done between the higher education and the further education sector and the education sector. So I see that work and I've already had conversations with the education minister in relation that we need to make sure that there's a seamless join up so that pathways for people going through our education sector uh, run right through the, the entire three sectors uh, involved in that. Deborah Erskine. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Um, it is in relation to BT um, as well, and I would like to question just in a different uh, way. Uh, I would actually say the extension has actually created further uncertainty for the workers, um, and that's obviously uh, very detrimental to their own uh, lives. But in a recent response to me, you said that Invest and I are continuing to engage with BT. What does that engagement look like, and is that looking at different properties that uh, BT can go to within Enniskillen? If, the, if the, we're trying to understand what the rationale would be behind uh, a change in Enniskill and what that might involve. So, I, and I know two weeks extension maybe creates more uncertainty, but it also might buy some more time for the company to come at this in, in, a, in a more uh, supportive way uh, for the staff that are there. If the issue is property issue, then we're very happy to work uh, with BT to identify what property may suit their needs down there. So whatever is presented to us as some of the issues is causing them uh, a reconsideration of their operation and a skill, and then we are happy uh, to work with them in that regard. We haven't got the full sense of that back yet, uh, but Invest and I, I remain ready to engage them and have engaged with them. We've also engaged with the unions there as well uh, to try and get an understanding of what might be the issues at the back of any potential decision to take and to how best to try and offset that. Ms. Erskine. Thank you. There is conflicting information that comes out in relation to BT constantly. Um, and as I say, that is at a detriment to the employees. Um, and we are seeing in Inniskillen that some jobs are being re-advertised already. Um, and again, that creates confusion. And I would just urge the minister to ensure that he can do everything in his power to keep these jobs in Inniskillen because it is uh, the Communications Workers' Union has found that it's £9 million to our economy in Fermanagh that these jobs create. Minister. I would, I would hope that the company is as clear as possible and that we don't add to uncertainty and undoubtedly stress of people who are waiting to hear what the outcome of this uh, review is. Uh, so I would, I, I would be asking my officials to make sure the company is as clear as possible and they don't end up adding unduly to people's stress. But yes, our primary objective is to retain the jobs or to try, and if there are particular issues that, that BT are identifying, to try and work with them to, to resolve those issues. Uh, but we are in a stage where they, it's, it's obviously a global issue that they're dealing with in terms of restructuring. Uh, and, and we're in a situation where we're reminding them of our particular commitment to jobs uh, in the regions here, uh, west of the ban in particular, uh, and that, that you know, what they would, if they were considering something which was detrimental to that, then they would be going against our entire economic policy. Uh, so, yes, we will have those conversations and we continue to have them in the days ahead. And the Dillon? Can I ask the Minister, given the recommendations that have come out in relation to credit unions today, whether you will take up those recommendations and bring them forward? I yes, am very happy to speak today at the event involving the credit unions up in the Long Gallery, and they have played a, a very vital role <coughs> in terms of provision of financial support for families and for small businesses for 65 years now, uh, a, a key 
the cornerstone of that, that local level uh, financial support for people. And yes, they have identified issues in terms of their manifesto that they want to work with us on, and we have committed to putting together a, a group to deal with them and to try and bring those recommendations forward. If members take the raise, we'll just change the top desk for a commission questions. Thank you.